from Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number eight, recorded on July 12, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, getting to the chase on important health topics. And today I'd like to take a closer look at his post entitled The Causal Cruelty of Placebo-Controlled Trials. Uh, so, Paul, you start the piece with a statement made by anti-vaccine activists, quote, government officials, pharmaceutical companies, Public health agencies, scientists, and doctors are lying to you about vaccines. So, well, first of all, I can't imagine all of them conspiring, conspiring to lie in the same way that scientists don't even agree. But given that, what are they lying about? And do people really believe that? I certainly think there is a, a, a group of people in this country who do believe the anti-vaccine activists and their tropes. Um, the, the thinking behind this claim is that um, vaccine trials are not really placebo controlled. So therefore, because the placebo itself may be dangerous, then you can't really tell whether the vaccine is dangerous. And therefore, all vaccines might be dangerous. I mean, um, that's where they're coming from. Sadly, they can get at least a subset of people in this country to believe them because at, at, we're living in an age where um, conspiracy theories are no longer marginal. They become part of the mainstream. Even, you know, congressmen will use terms like deep state. So I think it's a different time. If you license a vaccine, well, let's say you do a safety study, you do a phase one for safety. If the placebo were actually dangerous, wouldn't all the people have severe adverse reactions? And we don't see that, right? Sure. No, it's a stepwise process. I mean, you you know, you go from phase one, which is maybe a hundred people, to phase two, which is a few hundred people, to to rule out initially just sort of any common serious adverse event, and then you do the big trial, the phase three trial, which is tens of thousands of people, which will rule out a relatively uncommon serious adverse event, but not a rare serious adverse event. I mean, that that those kinds of trials can only be done post licensure in 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 which will then be picked up by the sure. vaccine events reporting system, and more importantly, the vaccine safety data link. That's where you pick that up. And so the good news is those those systems are all in place to pick that up. And that's why vaccines, I think, are held to a very high standard of safety and efficacy. So we talked about this last time, but the, the, the placebo definition, this is a big part of uh, this, this point that they're making. And um, that's something that RFK Jr., talked about, you know, placebo controlled trials are never done. And and in your article, you talk about them using a CDC definition of placebo. So explain why that isn't correct. Right. So they, they first of all, the CDC doesn't uh, regulate vaccines. That's the Food and Drug Administration. The CDC is a recommending body. But so they, they what they do is they just sort of make up a series of things which then supports their point of view. So the CDC definition, according to them, is that a placebo, a placebo is something that has no effect on any living organism. I can't think of anything that would be, but they, they argue, we'll see, like, therefore, if you use that definition, only water or salt water could be considered to be placebos, true placebos. Well, first of all, water and, and salt water, which are both chemicals, um, can, can have a negative effect on living organisms. They, you can have water intoxication, drink three to four liters of water, and you could exceed your body's capacity to hold on to sodium, and you'll have a seizure, which could be fatal. And has been. Um, salt also, there is such a thing as salt intoxication. So I think that the FDA definition of placebo is something that is inert, which I think to them is defined as immunologically inert and harmless. And, and that's what is usually done. So, so typically it'll be what's in the vaccine. And then the, the placebo is, is, is those buffering agents or stabilizing agents or emulsifying agents, uh, but no actual vaccine virus or, or bacterial protein. So that that's, you could basically control for the vaccine itself by isolating that as a variable. So would a, let's say an adjuvanted vaccine, would the placebo have adjuvant or not? It could, uh, it could have an adjuvant, but again, it's not adjuvanting anything. Right. Uh, I mean, if it's, if it's an aluminum salt or if it's a so-called CPG motif, um, you know, it's not adjuvanting anything. So, because again, the other substances are, immunologically inert. So therefore it's harmless. So are all uh, vaccine trials placebo controlled? No, 
uh, and nor should they be. So, for example, um, when Prevnar 13, so Prevnar was a conjugate pneumococcal vaccine. Prevnar 13 had 13 of the roughly more than 90 serotypes of pneumococcus in it. When that was brought onto the, the, the market, uh, it had to be tested in a phase three trial. And so the, the, the control group there was Prevnar 7, which had been uh, licensed and used years before that, contained seven of the pneumococcal serotypes that commonly cause invasive pneumococcal disease in children like pneumonia, meningitis, sepsis, and had been shown to work. You'd clearly seen a decrease in invasive pneumococcal disease. So you can't then do a placebo-controlled trial. You can't ask parents to, to take to put their children at risk of pneumococcal disease when there existed on the market at the time a vaccine to prevent that. No parent should go along with that trial, nor would any any doctor reasonably ask a parent to. And the World Health Organization has been very clear on this. That would have been considered an, an ethical trial. And so what what the uh, RFK Jr. and ICON, what does that stand for? Do you remember the... the Formed Consent Action Network, a virulent anti-vaccine group, although that's not Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s. His is Children's Health Defense. So they would say you should do a placebo control in all cases, un not understanding perhaps that if you have a standard of care, you cannot do that. It's not ethical. And did. I mean, I can, this Informed Consent Action Network, which is run by someone named Dell Bigtree, they have actually petitioned the FDA to withdraw Sanofi's inactivated polio vaccine because, in part, it wasn't tested in a placebo-controlled trial because they're perfectly fine with having children receive a placebo at a time when polio still circulates in this world. And we just had a case of paralytic polio uh, in New York City last year. So, so, so that's why I think, although they consider themselves vaccine safety advocates and advocates for children, they're perfectly willing to put children in, har in harm's way by having a group receive placebo at a time when there are vaccines available that, uh, that could prevent the disease that we're trying to prevent. Uh, it worries me because the FDA does the right thing, right? They say we, we cannot have a placebo-controlled trial in certain cases, but you could imagine that given the right administration, they could be bullied, right? Yes, I think that's right. And it, I, I'm being perfectly <laughs> honest with you, Vincent. I am more scared now than I have ever been in my life about the fear of what's about to happen to vaccines. I think what happened with COVID was between the masking mandates and the vaccine mandates, we leaned into a libertarian left hook. And we really saw a, a, a galvanization in this country uh, against vaccine mandates. And, and it's already starting to spill over into all vaccines. Roughly one third of American parents now think that schools shouldn't mandate vaccines, any vaccine. I mean, do that. Eliminate school mandates and we'll be back where we were in the early 70s before, before we started to enforce school mandates when you'd have 150,000 cases of measles every year. And, you know, measles has a fatality rate of around 0.1 percent, which is to say one out of every thousand people infected with measles could die from it. Get to 150,000 cases and you're going to start to see children once again die from measles in this country, a virus that we'd essentially, or at least an infection that we'd essentially eliminated from this country uh, by 2000 will come roaring back. How, how can it be that these anti-vaccine organizations don't recognize this? What is driving them to basically uh, use unreasonable arguments? Well, their ultimate goal, I think, is to make it so that vaccines are no longer mandated, period. I mean, recently mm -hmm. they celebrated the fact that uh, Mississippi, which which only had a medical exemption to vaccines, uh, just recently uh, put forward where you could have a religious exemption to vaccines. They celebrated that moment because that's what they want. They want vaccines to be no longer required. Uh, that That's their goal. The way to achieve that goal is to scare people about the safety of vaccines. So you can't mandate vaccines if they're unsafe. And so they bring up all possible uh, things that, that they would argue are unsafe about vaccines, which isn't true. I mean, RFK Jr. said, you know, quote, that the, the COVID vaccine was the most dangerous vaccine we have. What? I mean, just they make it up. Most other countries in the world mandate vaccines, correct? Yes, especially. Yes, that's right. All, all countries at some level uh, have that. Or I would say most countries certainly have vaccine mandates. So in your in your post, you talked about the um, placebo controlled polio vaccine trial of Salk's IPV. Why don't you tell that story? 
Right. So, so um, in um, 1954, uh, we began the, the the trial of Jonas Salk's polio vaccine. So Jonas Salk took polio virus, grew it up in, in kidney cells, monkey kidney cells, purified it, inactivated the virus with formaldehyde, gave it to about 700 children in the Pittsburgh era, er, area um, and showed that he could induce an immune response that he believed was protective. Um, and then Thomas Francis ran what was, I think, arguably the largest trial of a medical product in history. Um, you had 420,000 first and second graders in this country getting uh, his Salk's inactivated polio vaccine. 200,000 received placebo. Now, as he, Salk didn't want that. He, the, the placebo was salt water. He didn't want that. He couldn't conscience given first and second graders in the United States in 1955, at a time when as many as 50,000 children could be paralyzed and 1,500 killed every year by polio. He couldn't conscience giving salt water to those children. And so to, to, to sort of mollify him, they also had 1.2 million children who were observed on inoculated control. So that was a 1.8 million child study. It took a year to do. It probably, if done today, it would probably cost about $3 billion. In any case, uh, it was run by the March of Dimes. And what they found was that the vaccine was safe, effective, and potent. And those three words were in the headline of every newspaper in this country when Thomas Francis made that announcement. Church bells rang out. Synagogues held special prayer meetings. Department stores stopped while, while the uh, results were announced over the loudspeaker. So how do we know it was effective? We knew it was effective because 16 children died from polio in that study, all in the placebo group. We knew it was effective because 36 children were paralyzed in that study, 34 in the placebo group. Um, that's how we knew. Uh, and and uh, I am sure that there is not a parent that volunteered for that trial that was hoping their child was in the placebo group. I mean, but for the flip of a coin, those first and second graders could have lived long and productive lives. And it is an emotional issue for me because I was a first and second grader in the mid-1950s, and I remember that trial. Um, but in any case, these are the gentle heroes we leave behind in, um, in these kinds of trials. And you could make the same case for the COVID trial. I know this is going to sound um, odd. We did a placebo controlled trial for the COVID vaccines, right? I mean, the, when uh, our committee, the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee, was presented those data in, uh, in December of 2020, Moderna's study, which was a study of a little less than 30,000 people, that was vaccine to placebo one to one. Well, there were 11 cases of severe disease in that trial, um, uh, all in the placebo group. And there was one death in the placebo group. But for the flip of a coin, that man died. And you could argue, you know, did we know enough? Did we know enough to, to make us feel comfortable that this vaccine was going to work and was likely safe? I mean, we certainly knew that, that, that we knew about this virus. We knew that SARS-CoV-2 spike protein was the attachment protein. We knew that the receptor binding domain was the specific part of this spike protein that was attaching. We knew that the mRNA vaccines made antibodies against that protein. We knew that it prevented the virus from, from attaching to and entering cells. We had every reason to believe that vaccine would work. And, and, you know, thousands of people were dying every day in this country, and, and we waited. We waited to do a placebo control trial, and then when we did it, then we rolled out that vaccine. But, um, you know, I, I remember when I finally got that vaccine, because it's, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Jaws, but there was um, there was a scene, have you ever seen the movie Jaws? Yeah, of course, yeah. All right, so there's a scene where, where uh, they're all sort of on the boat, and they're, they're telling their stories. So the Robert Shaw character, Quint, is telling his story about how he delivered the, the, the bomb, um, the, the bomb that ultimately was the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. And um, so now they're coming back to the United States, but they're torpedoed and they go into the, into the ocean and, and, and they're one by one, they're being eaten by sharks. He said the, the most, the upsetting time, the time when I was worried the most, when I was the most scared was when the helicopter was starting to pick us up, meaning now there was something to save us. But, you know, I may or may not have been saved then. And that's <laughs> what I felt about this vaccine. This vaccine was available. And there were weeks before I could get it from my hospital. It was just a tough time. Because now you know there was yeah. something to save you, but you hadn't gotten it yet. As you know, Paul, we, we have tried many vaccines against the spike of HIV-1. And they don't work, even though they should work, right? So you don't know. And, and there are vaccines that don't work. So you just you need to trial them properly. You can't just assume they're going to work. Right? There's nothing worse, as you say, to use something that doesn't work. But why not? It can't hurt, right? Right, or be unsafe. Uh, you know, it's it's um. Look at that trial, for example. I mean, that trial was in the case of Pfizer, a little less than forty thousand. In the case of Moderna, a little less than thirty thousand. What yeah. didn't we see in that trial? You didn't see myocarditis. You didn't. The trial wasn't big enough. 
right. but there was a system in place to pick up myocarditis, which overall had a general risk of around one in 50,000. You did pick that up afterwards. And I think that's the strength of, of vaccines. I really wish there was a sort of vaccine safety data link on the drug side a drug safety data. Like, I think were that true, you probably would have picked up Vioxx as a rare cause of heart attacks much sooner. All right, one, one last thing I want to ask you. This is not from your, your Substack, stack, but um, we are going to do Friday uh, a takedown of the RFK Rogan interview with Dan, Dan Wilson, which is, you remember, you recommended his original takedown. He wants to join us and do a more extensive takedown. So uh, I've been talking about that for a few weeks, and I got a letter f from a, a, a listener who said, you know, I think for science, you guys are the best, but you don't have any compassion for people who have, like me, a vaccine-related injury. And, you know, you may say it's 0.00001%, but for her, it's 100%, right? So she's living with it. And she says, you don't sympathize, and we don't care about your data, but RFK Jr. sympathizes with us. So how would you— respond to that. Okay. So, so, so certainly there are serious side effects associated with the vaccine. I mean, with vaccines, I think anything in medicine that has a positive effect can have a negative effect. So mm -hmm. the oral polio vaccine was a rare cause of polio. Right. Um, the yellow fever vaccine is a rare cause of something called viscerotropic disease, which is a nice way of saying yellow fever. I mean, it's true. It's rare, maybe one in a million, but it's real. Um, the, the uh, swine flu vaccine that was used in uh, Europe and for the 2009 pandemic was a rare cause of narcolepsy, a permanent disorder mm -hmm. of wakefulness. So I think no one's denying the fact that vaccines can be rare causes of serious adverse events. The problem with RFK Jr. is that's not what he talks about. He doesn't talk about those events. He, he's arguing that, that vaccines cause autism or diabetes or multiple sclerosis or attention deficit disorder or all, or all kinds of things that vaccines don't cause. So he's supporting people and the false belief that a vaccine has caused a particular problem when it didn't. I mean, were, were he a true vaccine safety activist like somebody like John Salomon, whose son was paralyzed by the oral polio vaccine and ultimately put, was on the committee, was on our committee, on the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, to represent that, that, that his son was paralyzed by the oral polio vaccine. He pushed very hard for us to move to the inactivated vaccine, which we did by the year uh, 2000. Um, that's a vaccine safety act. I mean, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is not a vaccine safety activist, quite the opposite. He puts out the notion that vaccines cause safety problems that they don't cause. Just out of curiosity, Paul, are there any uh, adverse effects caused by MMR that we know of? Sure. So, so measles, the measles, first of all, measles itself can cause thrombocytopenia, which is a lowered platelet count. The measles vaccine can do it also. It, okay. it occurs in roughly one in 25,000, one in 30,000, but we'll occasionally see that, um, in our hospital. Usually one to two weeks after the vaccine, you can see, uh, the child has thrombocytopenia, has petechiae, which this is generally, uh, short lived, but certainly the measles vaccine can do that. But, but what is, what, what is Robert F. Kennedy Jr.? argue for. He argues that measles, mumps, rubella vaccine causes autism, even though, you know, now 18 studies have shown that's not true. So he's not supporting those parents. All he's doing is supporting the false notion that that, that autism is in any way caused by vaccines. All right. You can find Paul Offit at Substack. We will put a link to that in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you.